Lives in the Balance, Richie Havens. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In a boon for military contractors, the United States is relaxing controls on military exports, allowing some U.S.-made military parts to flow to nearly any country in the world with little oversight. ProPublica reports, beginning this week, thousands of parts for military aircraft can be sent freely around the world, even to some countries currently under U.N. arms embargoes. Previously, military firms had to register with the State Department and obtain a license for each export deal. That allowed U.S. officials to screen for issues, including possible human rights violations. But now, tens of thousands of items are shifting to the Commerce Department, where they fall under looser controls. The changes were heavily lobbied for by military firms, including Lockheed Martin, Textron and Honeywell. The U.S. already heavily dominates arms exports market. In 2011, the U.S. concluded $66 billion in arms sales agreements, which accounts for nearly 80 percent of the global market. To talk more about this, we're joined by Bill Hartung, director of the Arms and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. Uh, Bill, we thank you very much for being with us. You've just completed a report on the Obama administration's loosening of controls over U.S. arms exports. Uh, your latest book, Profits, that's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, Profits of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military-Industrial Complex. Talk about what this Obama administration relaxing of the sending of weapons and parts means? Sure. Well, I think the amazing thing, which you mentioned, is that the United States already dominates the trade. It's not clear that they can make a lot more money here, but they're trying. And uh, one of the things that will happen is, if you're a smuggler and you want to do a circuitous path through a third-party country, those countries are now getting license-free uh, spare parts, surveillance equipment and so forth that can then go on to a human rights abuser, to a terrorist group. Uh, and detecting this is going to be much more difficult without the State Department uh, licensing process. How did this happen? Well, the industry has been pushing for this for two decades. And uh, they have a couple points of leverage. Of course, they have campaign contributions. They've got people on the advisory committees that help develop uh, these regulations. Uh, they've done studies making bogus claims about the economic impacts. And the Obama administration, more than even the Bush administration, bought into industry's arguments, argued, well, we're going to streamline this. It's going to make things more efficient. Uh, we're going to get the economic benefits. And I think they took a great risk in uh, taking those industry uh, suggestions, not looking hard enough at the human rights proliferation and anti-terrorist uh, implications of that. So I, I think they may have had good intentions, but I think they tilted way too far towards the industry. Several trade groups have been calling for this easing of restrictions on arms exports. Lauren Airy of the National Association of Manufacturers said in an interview with ProPublica that foreign competitors are, quote, taking advantage of perceived and real issues in U.S. export controls to promote foreign parts and components, advertising themselves as State Department free. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, this is an anecdote that comes up uh, frequently, but there's never been any documentation of how common this is. Uh, the Commerce Department was asked in a congressional hearing, what's the economic downside of the current system or the upside of your reforms? He said, we haven't looked at that. So they really haven't looked at the economic effects. In fact, if it's easier to export production technology, to build U.S. parts overseas, uh, this reform could actually make it worse for U.S. jobs, even as it helps the big companies like Lockheed Martin uh, outsource uh, their components globally. So talk about, Bill Hartung, the co countries that can get these weapons and these parts. Well, the uh, the first round is NATO allies, but it includes countries like Bulgaria, uh, countries like Turkey, which have had bad records of keeping those parts within their countries, keeping them from, from being transshipped uh, to um, you know, destinations that the U.S. would not want to see them in, places like Democratic Republic of the Congo, Indonesia during its most repressive periods, uh, basically almost anywhere in the world, uh, it's now going to be much easier to do this kind of roundabout uh, sale. But also, uh, many parts are going to be uh, license-free altogether. So they can go almost anywhere in the world other than uh, perhaps uh, Venezuela, Iran, uh, China in certain circumstances. So uh, the whole globe basically is going to get an easier deal in terms of getting access to U.S. military technology without very many questions asked. Can you explain, as uh, even the Obama administration is pushing for more gun control at home, how this happens now? Well, I think, you know, they promised this to industry. Uh, they see it as a big achievement that they've uh, undertaken since Obama's first term. 
they have taken a look at the firearms issue. They're going slow on rolling out those regulations because they know it's a very sensitive item. Uh, people like the gun lobby want no new restrictions, in effect, to roll back restrictions on gun exports. So I think there may still be room for leverage here over the administration because they have been uh, kind of shy about putting forward what they're going to do about guns, ammunition, uh, small arms, or light weapons, which are uh, among the biggest problems in terms of getting into conflict zones. So I think there might still be some hope there to turn them around, but, uh, you know, it'll take some pressure, which so far we haven't seen a great deal of pressure from the Congress on this. Countries like Bahrain that's cracking down on its own people, uh, protesting human rights abuses there. Exactly. Uh, Bahrain will probably have an easier time getting U.S. weapons. Saudi Arabia has just gotten a $60 billion deal, the biggest in history, for attack helicopters, fighter planes, guns and ammunition, armored vehicles. And they've been helping Bahrain put down the democracy movement there, also obviously repressing their own people. So not only are the sales at record levels, but they're going to some of the most undemocratic countries in the world at a time when they're supposed to be, our policy should be to support democracy in the Persian Gulf and Middle East, not, uh, you know, help the oppressors, as some of these sales will do. What should President Obama be doing differently, Bill Hartung? Well, I think, for starters, there should be a moratorium on any new changes in these regulations. Uh, you know, let them see what the first round, what the impacts are, which I think they're going to see are going to be quite negative. Second of all, for things that have gone over to the Commerce Department are not unvetted by state, there should be no laws to say, well, Commerce has to use the same uh, criteria as state in terms of uh, vetting for human rights. I think also they should look at what the economic impacts are really going to be. Instead of making these claims uh, about how it's going to be wonderful for U.S. jobs, really dig in and see how many jobs are going to be exported as a result of letting this technology flow more freely. I think if we could get them to do those three things, we could probably blunt the most uh, negative consequences of these so-called reforms. What's the type of military equipment, including U.S. arms, most commonly used in human rights violations around the world? Well, you know, there's things like tear gas. U.S. tear gas canisters showed up in Egypt, for example. Uh, there's things like, uh, you know, automatic weapons. There's armored personnel carriers. Uh, and some of the conflicts, obviously, against internal uh, adversaries. Very uh, quickly, Bill, I'm going to used... interrupt uh, just to get this sure. last question. You just wrote a piece um, saying, uh, after the shutdown, don't exempt the Pentagon. We've got 15 seconds. Well, I think the Pentagon's going to try to wriggle out of this when they've been had their budget doubled since 911. It's time to put them on a diet, put them under discipline. And I think their allies in Congress are going to try to do an end run around that, which I think would cost us uh, tremendously on the domestic side of the budget. So the State Department, uh, soon its employees will be furloughed, and I'm sure a number of them are right now. But the Pentagon um, has pulled back and called back uh, most of its employees. Exactly. They're already kind of on the verge of getting special treatment. We have to make sure they don't jack up their budget, which in recent years has been at the highest levels uh, since World War II. Bill Hartung, I want to thank you for being with us at the Center for International Policy. Uh,